breath, fever, um, pretty similar picture to pneumonia. Um, however, there have been some recent reports of um, varying adverse events or symptoms that patients present with, including GI effects, like we talked about, as well as anosmia or the loss of sense of smell. Um, so I think we're just starting to see a you know, whole range of side effects that these patients can present with. Um, here is a nice graph that shows the epidemiology data. I pulled this earlier today from the Hopkins COVID-19 tracker, um, which you, if you haven't checked it out, it was a very useful kind of terrifying tool. Um, it's open access, so free for everyone to use, um, but we'll go through this. So as of earlier today, there were 401,000 uh, infected persons in the U.S and 1.42 million infected persons around the world. Uh, that accounted for around 13,000 deaths in the U.S. and over 84,000 deaths worldwide. Um, just speaking about Illinois, uh, we're faring a little bit better than that compared to some other states like New York or New Jersey. Uh, we have around 14,000 infected persons um, and almost 400 deaths to this point. Uh, the big caveat here is gonna be with these numbers, again, we lack widespread testing capabilities, so a lot of asymptomatic patients in the community are not going to be represented in this number. Um, so really, this is just those symptomatic patients that have already been tested. As you can see, in the state of Illinois, we've performed about 70,000 tests between all the different sites. Um, here is the breakdown by region, by county. Uh, so the west and southwest, as you can see, are reporting few cases, which may have to do with either testing availability or just population density, who knows. Um, as you can see in the uh, top right corner, so Chicago has about 5,500 confirmed cases, and Cook County is close behind with around 5,000 reported positive cases. So obviously the highly dense metropolitan areas are being hit a bit harder than some of the more rural areas, which is not a surprise. Uh, so now the background is behind us. So um, as pharmacists, obviously let's get into what we do best, discussing potential medication therapies. Um, so these are the five agents that we'll be reviewing. There are others obviously out there. It feels like there's a new one brought up or mentioned every day um, that are being investigated or talked about on Twitter, but most um, of the info is still to come on those. So we'll discuss these kind of one by one. Um, here you can see the proposed mechanism of each of the therapeutic options, whether that occurs at the point of cell fusion or cell entry. Um, within the viral replication process, as you can see, or they can act as inhibitors such as IL-6 inhibitors um, in cases of excessive inflammatory response. So we'll start off with lopinavir ritonavir or Calitra. Um, it's an antiretroviral used in HIV. Um, so it works by uh, having activity against the 3CL protease enzyme that's um, contained within SARS-CoV-2 to prevent cleavage of the polyprotein during the viral replication process. Um, it, we'll get into the evidence here. It's a bit kind of um, falling out of favor at this point. So there was an initial case series. These are all listed just for your reference, by the way. I won't go into the nitty gritty on all of these. Um, but there was a case series of about five patients showed mixed reviews with Calitra um, after there was some in vitro data that showed some promise with activity against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this led to a retrospective um, trial out of a uh, multicenter cohort study of 191 patients out of Wuhan. 21% uh, of those patients actually received Calitra, and they were found to have a median duration of viral shedding of about 22 days. Of note, there was no observable difference in duration of viral shedding among survivors who did and did not receive Calitra. So really no benefit there. Um, and it wasn't associated with um, a significant difference between those who died and lived. Um, that led to a New England Journal article published in March, uh, which looked at um, 199 severely ill hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Uh, it was an open label trial of severely ill, again, patients um, with SARS-CoV-2, and they were comparing Calitra used with standard of care versus standard of care alone uh, for 14 days. Of note, patients had a 13-day median uh, time between symptom onset and time of randomization or receiving drug. Um, so that's just one kind of, kind of negative against the study, um, just that delay in treatment. Um, they had a primary endpoint to time of clinical improvement or live hospital discharge, which wasn't significantly different. There were six, it was about 16 days in both the standard of care and then the standard of care group with Calitra. Um, to really kind of no benefit here. They did show a numerically 
um, reduced benefit um, in terms of 28 day mortality and the modified intent to treat group, as well as a shorter ICU stay. So it's six days in those patients treated with Kalitra versus about 11 days, um, those who just got standard of care. So maybe some benefit there. Then there was also a uh, lessened need for mechanical ventilation. So about 30% compared to about 45% of patients who just received standard of care. So maybe some benefit, but largely I think the New England Journal article was kind of the nail in the coffin for Kalitra. Um, it's going to be kind of last line for most patients if they can um, tolerate or be enrolled in studies for other agents. Just of note, if you are seeing this, especially in the outpatient setting, um, so monitoring, it has a lot of drug interactions with CYP P450 enzymes. Um, you also want to look for coagulation, so it could um, have some impact on PTTs and INR. Um, um, and then we also want to look at the oral suspension uh, because that one has limited availability, so it may even be possible to get for these patients. Uh, in terms of adverse effects, so we see GI toxicities, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, as well as some QT prolongation and peripheral lipoatrophy uh, in those patients who receive it with long-term use. Um, just wanted to mention the drug-drug interactions. The University of Liverpool has a really handy reference for everyone. It includes all of the major agents that are being looked at, um, as well as common medications that we use for other indications. And so this is a really nice tool. The reference is listed here um, for anyone who wants to use it. It's open access as well. So I definitely encourage you to do so. Um, the next agent, which is a bit more controversial now and popular in um, news outlets is hydroxychloroquine. So it's an anti-malarial that is believed to interfere with the uh, glycolization of ACE2 and then reduce the binding efficacy between ACE2 and the host cell, again, based on that spike protein um, on the coronavirus. It also has some anti-inflammatory and immunomodulator properties that may inhibit some release of cytokines. Um, you can see here it's some um, dosing strategies. That's still up for debate. Um, there have been multiple dosing papers that have come out, and I think we still don't know what the best dose for patients is, so we'll get into that in a bit. And then if no, chloroquine has limited availability, so it may be hard to get for some patients. Um, so initially, there was some in vitro pharmacokinetic studies that demonstrated that hydroxychloroquine as well as chloroquine had, ac had activity against SARS-CoV-2 in these zero E6 cells, um, with hydroxychloroquine being more potent compared to chloroquine against the virus. Next in the middle, this is kind of the most infamous trial. So this was the French paper from Gautre and colleagues that looked uh, to evaluate virologic clearance at six days amongst 42 patients, 26 of which uh, received hydroxychloroquine. And you'll note that it says 36 patients on the slide. That's because they excluded six patients that were, quote, lost to follow-up. Um, when actuality, three patients were transferred to the ICU for deterioration, one patient died, one patient left the hospital, so actually lost a follow-up, and then one patient withdrew um, from treatment due to nausea that they couldn't tolerate. So some flawed methods here. Um, their comparator group was also patients who just didn't receive hydroxychloroquine, and they were kind of collected from random other sites um, other than the primary site, and that really wasn't discussed. Um, so we'll talk about that further, um, but they reported that use of hydroxychloroquine um, reduced um, or improved virologic clearance at day six. So it was 70% um, of the time versus 12.5% of the time compared to those patients who didn't receive it. And then there was also a subset of six patients who just happened to be on azithromycin, probably for bacterial pneumonia. Um, and they noted that 100% of those patients had virologic clearance at day six compared to 57% of those patients uh, with hydroxychloroquine alone. So this was all of the hype. Maybe we should put these patients on hydroxychloroquine with azithro. Um, but since then, we'll kind of talk about, the journal has actually updated, uh, they haven't retracted the article, but they have said that they're you know, highly disappointed um, and have questions and concerns about the um, publication of the paper. Um, here you can see on the graph, so the publication date and then the presidential press conference from Donald Trump. Um, after that, you can see, you know, a spike in terms of the reported use and an associated demand for these agents, leading to a shortage of both of these, as well as renouncing a shortage of azithromycin in some settings. 
Um, so again, there were major concerns. They said it um, not hasn't risen to the level of society's expected standards. However, it's still in print. So TBD, but I think the damage is already done. So we're seeing these patients on hydroxychloroquine and azithro, and we know there are major um, kind of drug-drug interactions, and especially in terms of QT prolongation. So today there was actually a preprint study um, that was released from NYU, uh, which re retrospectively evaluated 84 patients uh, who were adults uh, treated for COVID with hydroxychloroquine as well as azithro. Um, they found that amongst those 84 patients, 30% of patients experienced a QT prolongation of greater than 40 milliseconds. Um, and then 11% of those patients had an increase to greater than 500, um, placing these patients obviously at higher risk for arrhythmias. Um, although there were no cases of torsatsa point um, reported. Um, also, this you know, increase in QT was uh, noted around day three or four. So these patients are generally going to be treated with at least five days, up to 10 days in some cases, if not longer, in terms of prophylactic studies, which are ongoing. Um, so really, the authors of this study were saying that more than likely the um, risk is going to outweigh the benefit here. There is no definitive evidence that this drug works, um, and there's no differentiating benefit compared to supportive care. So really in those high-risk groups, uh, as you'll see on this slide, uh, so those patients with prolonged QT intervals, obviously you're going to want to at least monitor EKG frequently, if not avoid drug altogether. Of note in that NYU paper that was published today, um, renal failure was associated with um, severe increases in QT. Uh, greater than 500. However, people with normal baseline QTs weren't associated to be found um, to have this increase. So we're not going to know who it could affect. Uh, you could have a totally normal QT interval, and then you're started on uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithro, and you see that increase. So again, kind of a scary situation. We don't really know how patients will respond, and we may be exposing them to this risk. Um, so otherwise, we want to check blood counts as well as um, make sure patients have uh, eye exams. As we know, it can cause some um, possible damage to the tissue there. Uh, the dosing, again, is not well understood. So there have been studies that looked at various loading doses, upwards of like 800 milligrams a day, um, sometimes 600 milligrams twice a day. Um, so I think jury's still out there. We don't really know how to dose this drug effectively and if it has any effect at all. Um, if you do need to crush it, uh, you can give it via like a compounded slurry, but it's not recommended to crush the tablet. Um, and then adverse events, which we talked about, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, you can also see some GI toxicity as well as hepatotoxicity. Um, the next agents that we're going to talk about are the IL-6 receptor antagonists. So this is tocilizumab or Actemra, and then cerilumab or Kevzara. Um, so these are IL-6 receptor antagonists that work by inhibiting interleukin-6 pathway to block that IL-6 receptor and then the ensuing possible cytokine um, reaction that occurs. Uh, so cerilumab is an investigational agent in this use, or in this case, as well as tocilizumab. Um, they're both off-label. So the dosing of tocilizumab, there are two strategies here, either 400 milligrams times one for like a flat dose or an eight mg per kg times one up to 800 milligrams. And then the cerilumab is being studied as 200 milligrams or 400 milligrams. Um, so specifically for cerilumab, it was the first IL-6 inhibitor to begin enrollment for clinical trials due to its higher in vitro activity for the virus. Um, however, now there are also trials at certain centers for tocilizumab, so you may see either. Um, again, the role is going to be kind of this cytokine release syndrome um, in order to prevent that inflammatory response. Um, so the first paper that came out was really a retrospective observational that you'll see in the center of 21 patients in China who were severely ill with ICU admission, shock, or combined organ failure, as well as severe oxygenation requirements. Um, so mechanical ventilation, poor um, oxygen saturations, et cetera. And tocilizumab was compared to standard of care in these 21 patients. So they did the fixed dosing of 400 milligrams times one plus standard of care versus standard of care alone. Um, and they showed that it was able to reduce the oxygen requirements in 16 of 21 patients. In all patients, they saw a resolution of fever. And then in 19 of the 21 patients, um, they were shown to have improved CT imaging or resolution of the opacities, as well as those patients were able to be discharged. 
Um, so they're currently enrolling studies in the U.S. Uh, we at Northwestern are a part of one of the Ceruliumab trials. Um, and I know, I think Rush is part of a Tocilizumab trial. So these are agents that I think you'll see more and more. Um, but again, we don't have definitive evidence that their work are effective in randomized controlled trials. So I'm still waiting for that information. Um, of note, so you can see some hepatotoxicity. Some of our clinicians have reported that ceruliumab versus placebo, they can always tell when the patients receive ceruliumab because they see this huge hepatotoxicity uh, response. So they'll see ALT, ALT elevation. Um, you can see some blood count disturbances as well as secondary infections. Um, so we want to make sure that we're checking for history or evidence of tuberculosis in these patients as well as inflammatory markers like B-dimer, CRP, procalcitonin. Um, some patients may be, um, we may be checking IL-6, but that's a send out for us, so it may take too long for those to be available before we can actually act on them. Um, adverse events, like we talked about, hepatotoxicity. You also have uh, the serious and fatal infections, including viral, fungal, and PJP, and then gastric perforation. So lastly, this leads us to remdesivir. So this is an antiviral um, with activity against Ebola, MERS, SARS-CoV-1, and 2. Um, it's a nucleotide analog of adenosine triphosphate that incorporates itself into the nascent viral uh, RNA chain, causes it to like terminate prematurely. Um, so again, this is investigational only. So it's a 200 milligram IV dose times one and 100 milligrams IV daily for nine days. Um, you would have to enroll the patient in a clinical trial um, or obtain from Gilead via expanded access. So those are the two ways to get it currently. Um, the evidence that has come out, so it had good in vitro activity and Vero E6 cells again. Um, there was the first COVID patient in the U.S. who was a 35-year-old male, um, you can see on this screen here, um, who presented with a four-day history of cough and subjective fevers, as well as two days of, uh, of nausea and vomiting um, after returning from a trip to Wuhan. Of note, he just had a past medical history of hypertriglyceridemia, so not much going on there. He was admitted to the hospital on day five of illness with a positive PCR for SARS-CoV-2. He was stable for the first day or so, um, actually for the first five days. Um, and then on day five, evening of day five, morning of day six, um, his O2 stats dropped. He had um, a CT performed and his chest X-ray showed basilar streakiopacities in both lungs consistent with atypical pneumonia. Um, he was started on two liters nasal cannula as well as antibiotics. The following day, after that PCR um, was positive, they um, started compassionate use remdesivir. And within about three days, he um, had resolution of his chest imaging. The only thing he had was kind of a dry, nagging cough. Um, so he was able to be discharged alive. So that was our first kind of patient um, data that was hopeful that remdesivir could be of use in COVID-19. Um, and since then, there's been a case series of five patients admitted with COVID-19 in France with, a, again, a history of travel to China. So these were kind of older um, pieces of information. As we know, it's rampant in the community now, so you don't, don't necessarily need that travel history. Um, three of the five patients were critically ill and received from death severe in the ICU um, with kind of mixed reviews. Two patients um, survived, one of which only could tolerate a few days of therapy before they developed um, ALT elevation greater than three times the upper limit of normal, as well as a rash uh, after four days of therapy. The other patient um, was treated with a 10-day course and discharge, no issues. And then patient three was kind of more critically ill, um, developed an ARDS picture, um, and died um, after the full course of therapy. So mixed reviews again. There are 11 currently uh, enrolling clinical trials ongoing. Uh, one of which at Northwestern, and I know there are several throughout uh, the state of Illinois. Um, the one that we're enrolled in is an adaptive trial looking at non-severe and severe patients. Some studies are limited just to severe patients. So again, I think the role, of ther the role in therapy is still to be determined by these trials and the, if it's effective at all. In terms of monitoring, so hepatotoxicity again, as well as some uh, reversible AKI, you can see some coagulation disturbances. Um, this one you're going to have to obtain again through the expanded access criteria or enroll in those clinical trials. Um, that reversible AKI of note is uh, generally thought to be caused by the cyclodextrin that's in the IV formulation. Um, and you can also see some GI toxicities as well. 
So that kind of wraps up our treatment uh, therapy options. So just wanted to give a note to clinicians in hospital settings and the community. So for enrolling patients into these studies at Northwestern anyway, we have an investigational drug team, which has been phenomenal, and as well as our medication safety team, who's really um, put a lot of effort into streamlining these processes for us. Um, so if that's a resource at your institution, I definitely encourage you all to work closely with them. Um, as far as preparation and delivery, these drugs do not require special preparation in chemo hoods, although some sites are doing that. Um, but if delivering to floors or patients with suspected or known COVID-19, proper PPE should obviously be worn and proper hand washing should occur as well. Um, I recommend that all of you, um, or for anyone um, working in healthcare settings to ensure your workplace has a policy or procedure to follow delivery of medications and handling when possibly interacting uh, with COVID positive patients. Um, I definitely do want to take the time to thank you all, uh, especially frontline clinicians who are continuing to care for our patients. Uh, despite the major workflow disturbances, I know we're all on a lot more conference calls, i.e. this one, um, and safety concerns being on the front line. I can't thank you enough um, for kind of everything that you're doing and express how much appreciation we all have for you and all the other healthcare clinicians out there. Uh, so lastly, I just want to end with uh, what we can all do to help. So again, to tie things back to our quote from the beginning, uh, social distancing is really the best practice we have for prevention now. So please continue to practice this in order to flatten the curve and ensure our healthcare systems are equipped to kind of handle the influx of patients that we see over the next days to weeks to months. Um, and please stay home when you can. And hopefully this was somewhat useful for you all. Um, here's the post test, which I'll run through pretty quickly. So one, which of the following routes of transmission are associated with COVID-19? We've got respiratory droplet, fomite, fecal oral, um, both respiratory droplet or fomite, and then all of the above. So this one is just gonna be the first two. So the fecal oral, again, we've kind of ruled that out just because it's been found in stool, but not found to cause viral um, infections as a result um, or grown in media. And then the second one, so patient is a 71-year-old male with diabetes, hypertension, and CKD who presents with upper respiratory symptoms and found to have ARDS and subsequently intubated in the ICU. Which of the following treatments would be recommended? This is kind of an easy one because it's the only one we talked about, but it's going to be remdesivir in this case. So ulcetelmavir uh, has not been shown to provide any benefit, um, nor has faloxavir or dolutegravir. Um, so, again, we do have a lot of agents kind of being investigated and discussed. None of those have shown benefit, um, so remdesivir would be the best one in this case. So with that, I again thank you all and thank you IPHA for letting me be involved. Uh, sorry if I went over a little bit, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those also. Thank you again, Justin, for um, being able to present this. And we, we know it was very short notice. We started talking to you a little bit last week and uh, asking you to update the, uh, a lot of the beginning parts of the information um, with the most up-to-date uh, data that we have. So we greatly appreciate you presenting with us this evening. Um, sure. Starlin, I know you had a question about what is with zinc, and I'm not sure if you want to explain further your question or not. You, you can go ahead and, and I've unmuted you. Okay, so uh, it the press releases, um, they were talking, I do know in New York they were adding zinc to the to the tri, to the bifecta to make it a trifecta. And I just wondered if you had any um, information. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking it's kind of a mediator adding zinc to the, to the process, but right, I- Right, yeah, so used you. with hydroxychloroquine. Right. Yeah, so um, the mechanism there, I think it's still to be determined, but it could possibly like increase some potency and reduce some of the ADRs associated with hydroxychloroquine. Um, we currently aren't using it uh, or recommending it if patients are started on hydroxychloroquine. I know uh, NYU, I believe, in one of the centers that have MassGen, actually Boston, um, was recommending it. So I think it's just kind of mixed use. We're still trying to figure out what's the best thing to do for these patients. And so that's been explored in some cases. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Justin? Uh, not seeing any others. Um, Justin, again, thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, 
um, take back over on the screen and uh, we'll in, in, in enter you in with the rest of the conversation here. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. We did have another question. Do you know if anyone is doing any of the antibody testing at this point? Yeah, so that's being studied um, in a few patients kind of all over the world, really. Um, and the discussion of like convalescent plasma, so those patients who have recovered, that's obviously been a hot topic. There was a case series published in JAMA, um, as well as Lancet ID, I believe. So those things, I think, are treatments that may be down the line. Um, but they are performing serologic testing to see kind of what the, you know, Ig mediated response is in terms of IgM and IgG and how long those last. We know with things like SARS-CoV-1, um, IgG generally lasted for around three years to provide some immunity. Um, so if there were any mutations or anything, generally you wouldn't see that um, until after that immunity, immunity kind of wanes. Um, but because it's only been a matter of months since we even identified the virus, we don't have all of that information back yet. And there are obviously in development of vaccines, et cetera. Um, that's just now been starting to be used in like phase one human trials. Um, so it wouldn't be probably a year plus before we actually saw that, you know, commercially available and widespread. Exactly. Well, get, Justin, thank you again very much for uh, presenting your data and um, being available this evening. Great job. Sure. Thanks so much. Bo, I want to turn it over to you and um, We'll go right ahead with um, the rest of the, the introduction of our uh, town hall here. You should be okay. unmuted. Yep, I'm good now. Thanks, guys. And Justin, thanks again for the, the great information um, on COVID as to what we know right now. We appreciate uh, everything you brought tonight. Um, good evening, everybody. And I'm glad you joined us tonight for the town hall meeting. I wanna thank each of you for your response to the COVID pandemic, the measures you have taken to protect your patients and your pharmacy staff have been remarkable, all while maintaining healthcare access for your patients. We at IPHA know that you are struggling with access for PPE, access to MDI inhalers, and many other hurdles that have uh, presented itself in the last several weeks. I want you to know that IAPHA has been working with the governor's office uh, to help Illinois pharmacists safely provide care our patients need. Um, and I think Garth will show a little bit more of that in a little bit. Um, again, thank you so hard for working to take care of your patients and uh, let all of your staff, your technicians, your delivery drivers, everybody to know that we also appreciate what they've been doing for us. Thank you. Thank Garth, you, Bill. Thank you. And um, I did send Justin a couple of your last minute questions and we'll come back to him here in a couple of minutes. Um, I did want to go ahead and touch on what I was talking about. Um, we did um, update recommendations to the governor's office today. And um, I'm trying to find my window where it is. There it is. So the pharmacy organizations, along with Irma, submitted a more concise recommendation, less specifically trying to address the upcoming couple of weeks. We sent last month a packet of recommendations uh, in addition to a joint paper from the national organizations addressing four or five major um, areas of concern. Our recommendations for right now, what we're trying to have the governor address for the upcoming um, days. And I'm being told my audio is really broken. Hang on a second. Is my audio better now or is it still the same? Okay, hang on one second.
hopefully this audio is better. Okay, good. All right, going back, this is the um, current packet of, re of five recommendations that we've made to the governor's office. And um, they really haven't changed. These were in the original packet. Um, there's only one really new one. Uh, first, we're asking to waive any restrictions on who can be behind the pharmacy counter in the pharmacy department. As we know, the Practice Act says it's limited to pharmacists or technicians. And we're, we're asking to be able to be a, little, a lot flexible with that. It also includes for people who can deliver prescriptions. Um, the new one is allowing retired pharmacists and certified technicians to be able to renew their license, um, waiving any license fees or CE requirements. And this is very similar to what's gone on for um, physicians currently and nurses and some other healthcare providers who are coming back that are retired. We're asking um, that all they require all community-based pharmacies to work directly with local health departments to expand capacity and this be for distributing medical um, countermeasures. As we know, as we continue to um, engage with this pandemic, that we may continue to face more medication shortages. And we've been working on a project for almost three years with public health, um, trying to link community pharmacies with local health departments in being able to distribute countermeasures and if there was a vaccine, to be able to administer that vaccine. Um, so we're at least trying to help establish the communication links because local health departments are going to be strained as they try to service their communities, especially as we get into the deep southern part of the state, especially when we get to um, the Delta 16, um, where it's 16 counties under one health department. Um, we're, going to, we're asking to waive restrictions to allow pharmacists to administer all medications. And probably the most contentious one, waiving restrictions to allow pharmacists to conduct therapeutic interchange. Um, so we have um, gone through the rationale with, with each of these. I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to say that we did spell out all of our recommendations. And we did add, again, the joint letter um, and paper from the 12 national organizations, just reinforcing and supporting our request. And so again, that is at the governor's office. Uh, we're still working with the departments. And I do want to say that there has been movement. There's been a lot of our recommendations that have been um, addressed. And I do want to kind of review some of those because I think some individuals think that we're not getting a lot um, done with the governor's office and or with the departments. And I do want to address that there is a lot of movement going on to help allow us to be able to practice better. Um, probably one of the first ones that we knew, one of the very first um, emergency orders that occurred was that DFPR extended all of our licenses to September 30th. And that was a big one because that was for, you know, we were all due to be going through relicensure at the end of March. And there were a lot of us that still hadn't done it. Um, so, this is something that we don't have to worry about now until September that includes CE requirements. So those of us who are a little behind, um, this does allow us to be able to um, have a little bit of breathing room as we continue to address the public. Addressed in Emergency Executive Order 9, the governor did expand telehealth services. And I know a lot of pharmacists aren't aware, even though we've talked about it in many law updates, that pharmacists were added to the Telehealth Act. And we are considered providers under the Telehealth Act and have been now for almost two years. And so we are able to, um, making sure that we are able to um, impact uh, patient health care um, using telehealth. Now, this executive order specifically allowed out of state health care providers to be able to engage in Illinois patients. But I wanted to use it as a pointing out that you can still do this yourself. The Department of um, Financial and Professional Regulation has also um, issued additional emergency regulations. This first one was allowing out-of-state pharmacists to be able to, that are in good standing, that the, that the state of Illinois will consider their license in good standing, and that they shall practice in the state of Illinois, but only under the direction of IEMA, the Illinois Emergency Management, and Department of Public Health. 
companies cannot just bring in people just to have them start working in the state. It has to be under the direct su uh, supervision and direction of IEMA and public health. But this is a major step forward. I know there's been a couple of questions. I'm going to address them as, as we get through all of this. The second one was the department finally, this past week, issued um, prescriber guidelines for during the emergency declaration. Basically remind um, that providers that while they do have the right to prescribe FDA approved medications for office off-label use, um, but that there has been some alleged misbehavior that they may have violated the various professional acts. It also reminds them that they can be disciplined for unprofessional prescribing, and it also reminds them that there has to be valid patient-provider relationships. And it does caution them about the ethics of prescribing for their own family. So again, um, it does remind us all that there is the emergency use authorization, but the emergency use authorization is only under clinical studies. It does not allow physicians just to start writing for themselves. Um, so again, this is just a reminder that we're, we're glad to see the department take a stance on this. Um, we wish it had been a little bit stronger, but we're glad that they took a stance anyway. This is a little misguiding whenever you're looking at the department's um, website because if you would think that this is only in guidance for conserving PPE for compounding pharmacies, um, which this first page is, but it also allows pharmacies to compound alcohol-based hand sanitizer and goes and shows you, links you to the USP toolkit for this. But there are also three additional pages on other topics. For pharmacy. So again, this is dispensing guidance for pharmacists during COVID-19. It basically reminds pharmacists that we can utilize our professional and clinical judgment when it comes to whether a prescription can be filled or not. And the second one is on remote processing. And this is more of a, a, a reminder. If you have the ability to remote verify or in remote interact with patients and remote processing of your prescriptions, you that under Section 25.10 of the of the Pharmacy Practice Act, and this is a reminder that you can already do that. So for community, long-term care, and for health systems, you're able to remote remote process. And this was good. This kind of helps with some of the community pharmacies in in combating some of the issues from PBMs. This is the department ordering pharmacies basically to offer delivery service to patients and patient representatives and their authorizations and trying to do the best to make sure that we are delivering medications during the stay at home order. And this is in relation to the stay at home order, uh, executive order 10. Um, but again, we have to make sure that we have patients consent to deliver prior to taking the prescription to them. So it was nice to see the department stepping up for pharmacists right to service patients. A um, couple of the questions, one question here, what protections are we putting in place for oh, line one of the recommendations that we had, um, HIPAA, et cetera? Uh, basically, you have the authority and you have the responsibility as a pharmacist, and especially if you're the pick, to make sure that at least any individual that's behind your counter is HIPAA trained. Same thing here at the office. Whenever we have any student come into the office, they're HIPAA trained. All of our staff at IPHA are HIPAA trained, even though they're not technicians. So anyone behind your counter must be HIPAA trained. So if you need to HIPAA train your entire staff in your store, get it done now. Because in case you have to use them, don't have to worry about having to stop to do that. Does a delivery person need to be a licensed pharmacist or a technician? Um, that's still, um, right now, they they do. Um, that's still a very gray area that we continue to work with the department on. We're trying to get that because mailmen aren't technicians and mail carriers aren't technicians. So why should, um, if PBMs can ship through UPS and it's delivered to a patient, how come pharmacies, community pharmacies can't have a non-licensed individual 
take it to him. Yeah, Starlin's like going right here, lobby money. That's what it is. And um, but uh, it is a good question, and one of the reasons we put it in in, in the waiver request. And someone said, uh, good job for us unifying the voice for pharmacy. And we wanted to make sure that that this was pharmacy talking as one. And this is as many aspects as we can get. We know a couple of the colleges um, may have also submitted letters um, supporting some of, the, some of our efforts here. And we applaud everyone for working together as we go through this. Um, I did also want to um, remind everyone that let me switch over, sharing again. That in addition, HFS has also released a number of um, alleviations on a lot of policies in relation to Medicaid. Uh, we know that some of the MCOs are better than others in trying to also formula follow these guidelines, but um, Medicaid did say that any proclamation that they're putting out, they expect the MCOs to also follow as well. Um, this is just one. This is the main one addressing pharmacies, but there are, there are other policy provider notices on telehealth, and we'll get all these up on the COVID-19 page. Um, I actually had an error whenever I was copying code into the page today that took it back to an older form, so um, I've got some work re-updating that tonight. Um, but we'll get all this information up there for you and um, to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information. I do just want to remind you, I know that Justin had showed you the uh, um, the uh, John Hopkins national data or the global data, but there's also the Western Illinois dashboard as well. Just um, sometimes it's a little bit easier to kind of see what's going on in the counties by numbers. That's a version of this is also available on the um, on the, uh, the coronavirus.illinois.gov site. And then one last thing, and I'm going to turn it back over to Justin to help answer some of the last questions that we had. I do want to say this is our social distancing guidelines again. This is a map trying to show, again, put your aluminum hats on. This is uh, showing how close we all are and how much we're moving based on our cell phone data. I had to say last week I got a little concerned because Thursday and Friday and even part of the weekend, Illinois and most of the country was in a D or an F. And that's just because of the, of the good weather. I'm really surprised that this hasn't gone any worse. As you can see, um, some counties are better than others, like Sagamon County is at a B, but Christian County is at a D. I'm really impressed to see Cook County and the collars really stepping up and doing very well in social distancing. Only Cook County last week was in a B. Um, so it's really good to see that people are really starting to, to take heed to the whole stay at home, stay safe, and save lives. Um, Justin, I'm going to take it back over to you if you were able to address those questions. If not, I can read them again real quick for you. Sure. Actually, I saw that noise pulling up. Um, yeah, so it looks like uh, washing nostrils with hypertonic salt solution should wash away the virus. Um, I mean, I yeah, in theory, I guess that could work if it's just uh, an antiseptic, um, similar to like decolonization. So yeah, that could possibly work. Um, again, we don't have any trials that I'm aware of um, or evidence. And then any news on Nigella sativa or black seed oil? I am unclear about either of those. Um, looks like it has been studied as adjunct therapy with hydroxychloroquine in regard to its modulation of inflammatory cytokine response and oxidative stress. Um, yeah, I don't know that that's been studied well in COVID, so I don't know if there's a role or not. I think we were still going to need more information to figure that out. And again, this is just one of probably thousands of agents that are out there that people are now exploring. Um, so as time goes on, I think we're going to get more and more information and some things that were included in that presentation and then we're using routinely in these patients, you know, will fall out of favor. Um, and some will hopefully be, you know, evidence-based and be able to be effective for our patients. So jury's still out. Thank you. Uh, I didn't know that one of our members, Warren Winston, wasn't able to um, join us. 
Um, he was going to join us this evening, but he had a couple of questions or at least wanted to pass along information. We talked about some of the Department of Corrections last week and the Bureau of Prisons and that it doesn't look like Illinois has any um, any um, current cases within the federal prison system. But we do know that we do have it in the state system and that um, public health is trying to do all they can to try to alleviate that situation. Um, one last thing that I do want to bring up that happened about an hour before our call. If I can get back to my Chrome. Is that Secretary Azar issued a statement authorizing pharmacists to be able to order and administer COVID-19 tests. Um, this is huge. This is very a big step forward for the profession um, and a very clear sign that the department um, the, from a federal level that pharmacists are starting to be recognized for what we can do to help fill gaps. This does not equal provider status yet because this doesn't establish any way for billing or getting paid. This is kind of having our foot about halfway over the line. So Congress still has to act. This is a major step forward. There will be more clarification as APHA, NASPA, and NCPA and NACDS are digging into this. I know that they're having discussions right now as we're talking, trying to go through all of this, trying to figure out exactly how this will work. Um, for what we understand, this may not require a CLIA test because it's being done under the CARES Act. and um, so far, a lot of the emergency authorizations on COVID-19 have not required CLIA, um, but if it does, we will be asking the governor's office to issue a CLIA waiver for all pharmacies just because it's, it would just take too long to get everybody processed. Because um, as you remember, CLIA is a federally um, run program, but it's administered by the states. So it's a little complicated. The feds say, yeah, we have this, but we don't do anything with it. The states all run it. Um, so we, it is a partnership on that. So this is a big effort. We do, please do take a look at this tonight or tomorrow. We did link to it on our Facebook and Twitter. Um, and we will be going through a lot more information as we go forward. Um, We did have um, a request to show um, the interaction website again. And Justin, since I have your slides up, I'm just going to bring that up real quick. That one slide you had on the interactions. Sure, yeah, that's uh, University of Liverpool. So if you just search COVID-19 drug interactions, it should pop up. Um, they're actually a really good resource for HIV and Hep C drugs as well, um, and all of those are available. So this is just one screenshot with analgesics, but they have, you know, every, well, not every medication, but nearly every medication you can think of, um, as well as the main agents that are being used or studied. So, yeah, I highly recommend it. Uh, Justin, before you go mute, I had another question come in via text about sure. sanitary procedures uh, for pharmacies. Uh, specifically community pharmacies, accepting money, uh, checks, credit card, is there any risk compared to any other social distancing measures? Uh, a lot of pharmacies are foregoing signatures entirely, um, but just trying to find out is there any risk in just in passing, is there been any data to show that there's any increased risk from that small that, that interaction between money, paper, plastic, and, and, and that type of contact? Right. So there have been some studies that look at how long the virus kind of hangs around. So uh, on stainless steel and uh, there's another surface that's now escaping me, marble maybe, it lasted maybe upwards of like three days versus cardboard. It was several hours. Um, plastic, I think they looked at too, and was also several hours. Um, so in theory, yes, these things could be on your clothing, on money, on anything. Um, the biggest thing that you can do is, you know, make sure you're using hand sanitizer, wash your hands effectively, don't touch your face, don't put your hands in your mouth, 
So if you can, I would, you know, recommend wearing gloves or any PPE. Um, but then just making sure the biggest thing is going to be washing your hands um, to kind of reduce the amount of transmission or spread. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Dave, you had a question about information in the last few days about lupus patients. Large clinics have been using hydroxychloroquine for years in, in groups without major side effects. They are still looking through CMS and Blue Cross Blue Shield records for anyone who has contracted COVID-19, but so far no cases have been found. Food for thought. It, it's interesting, and I think that will be something as we continue to figure out, you know, is there truly a connection? So it, it is something that should be looked at. Um, another question about what certificates or training required to administer the COVID test that will be coming. Um, you all need to be trained. Let's just put it that way. Let me be completely clear on this. You have to be trained on how to do this. And we will be working with um, NACDS in particular on this because they have the certificate training program and APHA and in working on a modified training to address COVID-19 testing. Um, it, as someone who's trained as a, as a faculty person for that program, it is easy for you to learn. But there is a right way and a very wrong way to do it. And we also have to make sure that we have adequate PPE. This is not something, I'm going to be very blunt, not something that pharmacies can just half-ass and just start doing. If you do this wrong, you can infect yourself. And if you don't have 100% of the right equipment, you 100% do not do it. Um, Let's see here. Another possible option for the COVID testing is operate under a standing order like point of care testing for diabetes, correct, which is a gray area in the current Pharmacy Practice Act. Um, really looking forward to antibody testing on a large scale. Amen. I think once we go through and find out with antibody testing over the next days, months, weeks, and year, and as everyone starts to test the population to find out how many of us actually have it. And uh, that will be, we'll be able to know the true story a lot better once we have that information. Um, there, someone said, yes, training. Okay, good. Um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We had a lot of good information tonight, and I'm not wanting to, I'm going to go ahead and let us go to about 820. So if anyone needs to drop off, go ahead. But I did want to go ahead and um, make sure that we ask any questions or if anyone wants to raise their hand. I haven't seen any hands raised to ask questions. Uh, standing order based on what came out, we cannot order it on our own. Um, that is still to be determined. The way that the order from HHS says, authority for pharmacists to order and administer. So this could be a major step forward for pharmacy practice. And depending on how some of the legal aspects will look at it, this could override current pharmacy practice acts that say you have to have a standing order. So we don't know exactly if you need a standing order or not. We'll know a lot more in the coming 12 to 24 hours. So everybody just take a breath first, take a time out. <laughs> this, is, this is great news, but it's not like we can go grab COVID test today and start testing. Mm -hmm. um, this has given us the authority because mm -hmm. this was something in our plans to go back to talk with the governor's office after we started to flatten the curve and we got past the stay-at-home orders so that pharmacists could start testing. I mean, as we know now, the governor spent almost in his entire press conference today talking about how they don't have enough tests. So, again, this is getting us prepared for the next step. It's not saying, hey, go out and start doing it to tomorrow. It's saying, we've got you guys prepared. Now it's time for you to get ready because we're going to be asking you to do this very quickly, very soon. But that day's not here just yet. Um, any other questions, comments? Anyone have their hand raised? No hand raised? Um, any other questions? Hello, Gar. Yes, go ahead. Yes, Alfred Evans here. I just wanted to. Go ahead, Al. Good to hear you. Good, good, good to talk with you. Just want to thank Justin for a great presentation. 
And I also want to applaud the association for the great steps and giant steps they're taking for pharmacies in the state of Illinois. One thing I would like to caution uh, uh, a step that we, we, we're considering there, that on waiving restrictions of who can enter a pharmacy department, uh, I understand the need for uh, the help, but some retailers have designs where it's not necessary to even enter the pharmacy department. And I, I would suggest that we should see if those who do not have that type of design, they would probably would like to think about hiring more technicians so that they would have uh, uh, someone to uh, address the need to, to work the register. But to waive that restriction of who uh, can enter the pharmacy department, um, that's um, something that I would just be cautious of. Again, great job. A lot of things you're doing, Garth, are, are, are wonderful for, for everybody in the profession but also just be cautious of certain things like that waiving restrictions. Right, thank you very much, Al. I always appreciate your comments and thank you very much for being on tonight. Um, I do wanna remind everyone that we do have our guidance out there for trying to engage patients to make sure they're not entering the pharmacy. We still have our patient safety guidelines for pharmacies that are encouraging you go to closed door if possible and curbside and delivery service as much as you can. And if you, if you have a patient who's experiencing symptoms or just been discharged, someone in the household or them has been exposed, they should not be in your pharmacy. Please encourage them to um, have their providers call in or electronically send in their prescriptions and get them delivered or do curbside. One of the things that got brought up last week, we're going to be releasing it later on tonight. We kind of soft launched it yesterday. Um, the foundation will be accepting donations of PPE from any source that can provide it, is willing to donate it to the association. And then we will work with pharmacies that are in, in need areas of trying to get that dispersed. We, we don't know how, what type of response we'll get from this, but it was brought up by, the, by you guys last week that you wanted this and the foundation has decided to go ahead and try to see what we can get to try to bring um, needed PPE into pharmacies. Again, we know we're not, it's, we're looking at scarce resources. So we still recommend that pharmacies try to have gloves, face masks, not the N95s, but face masks. And if you can get face shields. Um, we'd like you to have more, but right now, especially with the new CDC guidelines that came out this week, which they're a little better, they're not perfect, but they're a little bit better. Um, it does help uh, help our cause to protect pharmacies a little bit better. Um, and Starlin's asking if there's any 3D printers, in, innovative 3D printers out there. We do know that there's been a lot of innovative projects with 3D printers, so if um, you are one of those individuals or you know someone, please get in contact with us and we'll work with you through the foundation to try to help out pharmacies. So we want to try to do what we can. Um, if we can get some supplies, we know they're very, it's very scarce resources right now, um, but we at least want to try and do what we can to help out everybody. We know that um, a lot of schools, not necessarily colleges, have a lot of this equipment and they may not realize it and they may have forgotten that they have it in their supplies. So if you're on a school board or you work with a PTA, you may want to engage your elementary or junior high or high schools to see if they happen to have any of these supplies that they may be willing to donate and we can work with them on the needed tax letters and everything. Um, any questions, comments, hand raises? All right, everyone. Well, again, I really thank you very much for taking time out of your Wednesday night again. I know we're all extremely busy. We're having very long hours right now, um, but we're doing what we took oaths to do, and we're fighting the good fight. We will win this, Illinois, and we're here to serve the citizens of Illinois, and we will continue to do so, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. Have a good night. And Starla says fire up for pharmacy.